Let's talk about the threat from China with someone who knows it well. He's a Mandarin speaker. He's a former naval intelligence officer. He is a host at One American News and a buddy of mine, Jack Posobiec, a.k.a. Poso, in the mix here. Jack, great to have you. Thank you, how about you? My thoughts, great my to thoughts be exactly. here today. Yeah. So tell me this. Uh, what do you think is the slowdown for this? I mean, this would be a big thing. This would be a bombshell if we have an intelligence community assessment that says that China worked in this election to influence on behalf of Joe Biden. We got Joe Biden's son in emails asking a Chinese Communist Party connected businessman for, you know, a wire of ten million dollars. And I'm pretty sure the rules that have been established, Jack, are if if there is foreign interference, we need a special counsel and maybe the election is just not legitimate. That's what happened for four years. Yeah, it's really amazing what's going on. So to give people the backstory on this, the DNI report is due to be on the president's desk by tomorrow, by Friday the 18th. This is set by executive order. You know, this isn't one of those reports. Oh, we'll get it done when we get it done. No, 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 no. This is set by executive order for the uh, for the intel agencies writ large, which comes under that sort of capstone of the DNI as an intelligence community assessment to be on his desk 45 days after the election. And by the way, this was something that when the president signed it, uh, this had bipartisan support. Obviously, we want to know if any foreign government is interfering in our elections. This was certainly shoved down the throats of every conservative, every Trump supporter for four years straight regarding Russia. But now suddenly we've got this guy, Chris Krebs, who's going out and testifying and saying, oh no, there was no uh, there was no interference whatsoever, most secure, you know, freest and fairest we've ever had, right? Well, now it turns out, and I was getting this information, reporting it out yesterday afternoon, uh, pretty early before the DNI made their announcement, that there's a huge dust up going on. It's really kind of turned into a massive battle at the highest levels of our IC, literally the highest levels, the DNI, over whether or not to include assessments regarding Chinese interference. And what's really interesting, and, and I know you know how to read between the tea leaves on official statements from the IC as well, that they actually mentioned in the DNI's report. Now, what I had said in my reporting for One American News was that there was uh, continuing intelligence, continuing raw intelligence coming in regarding Chinese operations. What the DNI said was there was new relevant information that was received after the election. Now, reading the tea leaves a little bit, the intel community doesn't usually find out about stuff like that, that big by the, uh, you know, long after the fact, 45 days after the fact. What most likely is going on here is that one of the 16 agencies we probably know which one that was, had the information and didn't share it with the others. And now they're upset about it. And so you're getting into this sort of, um, I'm not sure what if I can say that on, on, on air, uh, sort of um, a match of sorts regarding who, can, you know, who gets to actually cover this situation, who gets to work that problem set, work these targets. And now DNI Radcliffe is saying, look, you guys have an issue. Analytic trade craft, which we all we all learn, right? Analytic trade craft would say that when there's disputing assessments, you include them both, and you include the yes. reasons for why, and you and you set that out. That's basic 101 level stuff. But for some reason, one agency is saying no, you shouldn't include any assessment, even though there is raw intelligence. Yeah, and Jack, as as, as you I'm sure recall. It's hard for outsiders to understand you from the uh, you, you come at this from the naval intelligence side. I come at it from the CIA perspective, how intense and how how much these bureaucratic turf turf battles can get oh, yeah. deeply personal. I've seen adults in conference rooms with, uh, you know, draped with American flags and all kinds of uh, uh, you know, regalia of the of the federal government where people were cursing and screaming in each other's faces over over things yep. like this over what's included in an analytic assessment. So for those on the, in the outside world, this becomes incredibly heated and contentious. So that's one part of it. And that's it's, it's what you alluded to before. It's who gets control of this issue going forward and the resources and the White exactly. House attention that would come with that. But I also have to think, and we're speaking to uh, Jack Posobiec, former Naval, former Naval Intelligence Officer and, and One American News host. I, I also think that... Uh, when we look at this, there's probably some element, and it might even be the majority of this, where there are some people who are very pro-Biden, who are senior up in the ranks at 
I'm I don't know which agency I could as you bet, I could take a couple of guesses who think, OK, we got an incoming Biden administration. We got to protect as much as we can this team of of adults that's coming in from the back, uh, the backlash and, and the blowback of any China, you know, that becomes a big problem for the Democrats. Any China issue of, in, of influence the election makes Joe Biden an even bigger target for the stuff that we're already seeing with Hunter Biden and everything else. So I think they may be covering for him. And that's exactly right. And we saw this as well when intelligence became politicized during an election in 2012 when the Benghazi situation happened and you saw the intel agencies for at least for a time, right, when it mattered, they were doing everything they could to defend Barack Obama to make sure that their assessments were in line with, uh, oh, this cover story about a YouTube video rather than a terrorist attack until after the election when the truth just exploded all over the place and everybody knew what happened. And we found out, of course, that they all knew at the time what happened because it was obvious, right? Um, that's a similar situation to what you're seeing now is because they're also looking at making sure that they're in good standing with the, with what they perceive to be the incoming administration. They want to make sure that they maintain that relationship. And there are also people there who are looking at it from a perspective of keep in mind, and a lot of people have to know this, that uh, there's different stripes of and different you know sort of factions within the IC, but you do have your cold warrior types who for them Russia will always be the great bear. They are always America's uh, eternal enemy and everything you know that the IC does has to be geared towards Russia. But then you also have a younger type and uh, I think of these as like the Pete Buttigieg types uh, of, IC, of, of IC officers. He, he himself was a, uh, a reserve intelligence officer that they get their mindset from CNN, Washington Post, New York Times, and then they go into the IC. And so that that mindset, that framing of everything that's going on in the world starts with some pretty some pretty far left, right? It used to be kind of centrist, but now they're a little bit more far left in terms of their perspective, in terms of their coverage. So they already have an outsized view of Russia being a threat versus China, who we know, of course, has way more money, has way more resources. They have the Wu Mao 50 cent army of Chinese bots that was influencing U.S. Uh, social media networks in the run up to COVID-19. And after the COVID-19 pandemic hit our shores, right? we know that China was using these operations. So it strikes me as ridiculous that the intel community wouldn't have found any information about Chinese influence operations because we already know that they're here. Speaking of Jack Posobiec, host at One America News, former naval intelligence officer. Uh, and Jack, what do you think the Chinese Communist Party is going to try to do in a Biden administration? Meaning, what, what are their goals for the next four years? We could talk about their goals in the next 50 years if we really want to be terrified. But let's talk about the next four years. Well, so they're going back to the same mode that America was in, in terms of our relationship vis-a-vis -vis China under in the waning days of the Obama administration, there was this this phrase they used and it always shocked me. And I think it shocked a lot of people uh, out in the world when they heard it, but not so much in here in Washington, D.C. They talked about the managed decline of America. America is a declining power. America is on the road to uh, a soft, give America a soft landing. These are the types of phrases you would hear. And so the question that I always asked is, was when President Obama or and at times you would hear Joe Biden talk about this when he himself went to China. Remember, he was Obama's personal envoy to China, going around with uh, Xi Jinping, going to Sichuan University, bringing his son on Air Force Two. These things all happened, regardless of uh, whether Twitter will let you talk about them or not. And so they want America to be in that declining status, moving towards where a place, quite frankly, where the UK was uh, after World War II, when America was then on the rise, they want China to be in the driver's seat as the rise to a global, not maybe not a hegemony, but a global superpower in terms of where the United States used to be, right? And I always try to explain this to people. It's not necessarily that China hates the United States. They don't have disdain for us. They actually, in, in many cases, have a lot of respect for America's past achievements. That being said, um, they want to be where we are. A Chinese guy told me once, I want to be in a position where I see Chinese families adopting American babies and not the other way around. And that, you know, and, and he didn't mean it 
in a negative way. He didn't mean it as an insult. He just meant that's where he wanted his country to be. Right. They want to be that they want to be the global hegemon. There's no question right. about that. They're working toward that all the time. Jack, I, I also want to ask you about the, the Hunter Biden situation specifically, because you and I were corresponding early on about this to make sure that, you know, we were all lined up with what was really happening. And, you know, you verified important things for me to make sure that we knew that that story was was quite real when it was when it was breaking right before the election. Uh, do you think it's fair to say that Hunter Biden is compromised? By the Chinese Communist Party, I don't. You know, when you're in the IC, you're taught to look for flags, compromised flags. You're taught to look for these these indicators, right? And you're supposed to stack them. We're all given this training about, uh, oh, this person has four indicators. This five person has five indicators. I've actually worked on, which obviously can't get into, but I've actually worked on some of those situations. I have some experience with some of those situations uh, from a, from an operational perspective on on how the CCP works. Um, you know, so when I saw the Eric Swalwell situation, I said, well, yeah, this is textbook. It didn't even shock me at all in the least. I, I would be surprised if they weren't doing that, right? I, would be, I was only surprised that it leaked uh, publicly the way it did. Uh, Hunter Biden is quite possibly the most compromised person that we've ever had being this close to the White House. And I'm not saying that based on you know, my, my opinion, right? I'm saying that based on the emails, the reports, the money, his ties to these private equity firms that he still has stakes in, right? They say, well, he's off the board. So, okay, you took his title off, but that doesn't mean he doesn't still have a stake in the firm, right? That's what matters, the money. Um, and a, just from a perspective, you know, we know that China uses what they call yellow operations. So yellow involves anything that's, uh, you know, intimate. Um, Hunter Biden's a guy where, and I remember I've had access to this hard drive. He filmed all sorts of things and just strange videos, even when it was just himself, uh, very strange videos that this guy was filming. And to think that the Chinese don't have other videos of him as well as these videos that we've seen is, you know, it'd be ridiculous to think that they don't have that kind of stuff. So yeah, you do have a situation here where very clearly this is someone who's compromised financially and compromised personally. And so with Joe Biden, it's really strange that he's get, taken this absolutist perspective, right? He told us at the debate, remember, go back to what he said to the American people. My son has not taken a cent from China. These, there were no transactions. It was a smear. And now it's, well, these transactions were looked to and nobody said there was anything problem, any problem with it. And then the latest is that Hunter Biden's come out and said, my father had no information about these transactions. Right. right? It's just, it's just a so, cascade just, of changing lies, like the Hillary email situation, right, by the way. Right. That was exactly it's right. Crazy. And so you need to be upfront with the American people. It's as simple as that. Be upfront with the American people. And if there's something that happened that was wrong, be a man, be an adult. And I say this to Joe Biden, this is your son, right? This is your son. It's time to step up and be the role model that quite frankly, it looks like he never had. Jack Posobiec, One America News Network. Jack, great to have you, my friend. Take care. Thanks so much, bud. We're in a different holiday season right now. We've got Christmas, Hanukkah, New Year's, lots of reasons to normally celebrate and see loved ones, but there's all kinds of restrictions out there right now, and people are being more cautious, and that can mean you feel more separated from folks during this holiday season. But, you know, you can still reach out and bring them some joy. Send them some holiday cheer. Tell them you care and brighten up their day with an incredible bouquet of flowers from Bloomsy Box. Bloomsy Box are just better flowers. They send them to you so fresh, cut right from the farm, so they'll last even longer. And when you see the way people's faces light up, I love to do this and have it on Zoom or have it on a, on a FaceTime call so you can actually see when they get the flowers or you can see them with them. It just makes it all so much better this holiday season. Go to bloomsybox.com, B-L-O-O-M-S-Y, Bloomsy box.com use the promo code buck to get 15 percent off and free shipping that's bloomsybox.com at checkout use promo code buck for 15 percent off and free shipping it's gonna be tight in georgia everybody you need to keep hearing it. I, I know we've got stations down in Georgia, so there are people who are registered in the state of Georgia who are listening to this show right now, and this is going to be 
a very close election for both of those Senate runoff seats. Right now, the Democrats are playing a pretty clear game, or maybe in a sense, we know what their game is, but they're making it muddled, right? They're trying to avoid us understanding what's really happening here. And, and here's the situation. The Democrats are hoping that we're going to become a little bit complacent, overconfident, that people who are understandably furious about the presidential election in Georgia aren't going to turn out. That would be disastrous. Not only is there the Senate uh, balance, which is the biggest single issue in play here, but these these candidates, I mean, Warnock and Ossoff, these would be really problematic left wing legislators. These are not moderates. You know, this isn't like a, a Susan Collins kind of a situation on the Democrat side. These are leftists who are running. So it's not even just a function of the of the balance of power, which, of course, is the primary issue. But you got guys like like John Ossoff. I mean, this guy is a he's a trust fund baby, the classic limousine lib who wants to push the, the more radical left policies of the Democrats onto the nation if he gets into the United States Senate. Play clip 12. I think that the GOP attacks at this point are garden variety, fear mongering, race baiting. Look, they've been lengthening my nose in their ads to remind everybody that I'm a Jew. They've been running racist attacks against Reverend Warnock. And what's emerging in Georgia is the new South. You've got the young Jewish son of an immigrant mentored by John Lewis running alongside a black preacher who holds Dr. King's pulpit at Ebenezer Church. And we're traveling the state right now. You see this bus behind me talking about health, jobs and justice. So the GOP can run their playbook, which is fear and division. We're talking about what we're going to do for working people at a moment of crisis here in Georgia. Yeah, calling them racist and anti-Semitic. This is what you're going to get from uh, from Ossoff. And of course, you're going to hear similar stuff from from Warnock, too. Uh, Never mind the fact that Warnock is being entirely protected by the media establishment. I mean, they they will do anything to make sure that we don't know uh, that, that that not enough Georgians know that this is a guy who said you can't serve the military and serve God at the same time, that this is an individual who is not in the political mainstream, Ossoff and Warnock, but they are that the Democrats right now are full of a kind of a kind of hubris. They feel like they've got the momentum and they understand that we face a very, very different country for the next four years, if the Democrats have a majority in the Senate, that that is going to be problematic. That is going to be a serious challenge for us going forward. So for all of Team Buck Georgia out there, and I know we've got a lot of listeners. We've got people all around the Savannah area I know who listen to the show, and we've got people in the suburbs of Atlanta, and we've got various stations out there in Georgia. Uh, you Please, your, your vote. I mean, this election, this could be a Senate election That comes down to hundreds of votes. It's one percent in the polls that I'm seeing right now, and it's probably going to be even tighter than that. Norm Coleman got his seat stolen from him by Al Franken by a margin of literally hundreds of votes. We have thousands of people that listen to this show in Georgia alone and perhaps tens of thousands. And I would really like it if. All of you listening in the state of Georgia right now would please go vote and tell your conservative Republican friends, family, you know, Bob, the mail guy, Susie, the coffee shop owner, you know, whoever say you got to get out there and vote. you got to spread the word. Uh, If we if we go into the middle of January, if we go into a, a Biden inauguration with the Democrats picking off these two Senate seats, we are in for a rough ride, friends, and it's not too late. We can stop it. So let's do that. I recently got a crash course in home title theft, and you better pray this crime never happens to you because it goes after your most valuable asset, your home. Here's how it works. The bad guys, cyber thieves, they find your home's title online. Then they use a quick claim deed to kick you off, put themselves on, and start taking out loans against the equity in your home. You often won't find out about this until you receive payment demands in the mail, perhaps even a foreclosure notice. And remember, the usual identity theft programs do not protect you. You have to go with the experts I trust at Home Title Lock. 
All you have to do is go to HomeTitleLock.com, use the promo code RADIO, that I get you 30 free days of protection, and you can check online, check at HomeTitleLock.com, to see if you're a victim of this crime already and don't know it yet. HomeTitleLock.com, use that promo code RADIO for 30 free days of protection, and you want to take action now. Create a virtual barrier around your home's title before it's too late. Much easier to deal with this in advance. HomeTitleLock.com. That's HomeTitleLock.com. It's Harsanyi time, everybody. Our friend David Harsanyi from National Review in the mix now with all the biggest, most important stories of the week, or at least the ones that he most wants to talk to us about. David, great to have you back. Always a pleasure. Thank you. So I, I, I had to laugh this week. Uh, we had uh, Steve Schmidt, who I am I am uh, not shy about criticizing for his absurd commentary on the show on a regular basis. Um, I, I do think maybe offers up. I don't know if he is the dumbest political commentator, but offers up some of the dumbest political commentary you could find anywhere and, and has been doing this for the amusement of Democrats for years. A former Republican GOP strategist or whatever. Uh, now it comes out that he and other people from the Lincoln Project are Democrats. I mean, they're formally joining the Democrat Party. I, I remember what I was saying that these people are called Democrats two years ago uh, or three years ago, you know, whatever, even before they had the Lincoln Project. And and uh, they were saying, oh, no, they're the real conservatives. Turns out not so much, David. No, and, and, and Steve Schmidt is especially knock shit like you know the things he says are especially dis, uh, dishonest and mis, you know misleading and nasty um but he's not a very bright guy and uh he's always i mean once you start going after senators like uh collins and maine or or other moderate republicans you're no longer anti-trump you're just a democrat which was always my problem with the lincoln project you want to you want to go out there and campaign for democrats that's fine but if you want to be on CNN and other stations pretending you're a Republican who's just so hurt by the mean things that Donald Trump says, um, you're misleading the public, right? And it's a scam and a con. And that's, of course, what those guys are running over there. Um, so I, I don't really understand why he couldn't. <laughs> it's weird that he had to tell everyone he's going to be a Democrat when he could have just continued that con. I guess that because they had such little effect on the election, they're going to try something new. I don't know. But um but yeah, I mean, it's such a joke. It seems to me like uh, there's going to be a whole lot of former conservative or whatever they call themselves, you know, GOP strategists at CNN and MSNBC who only have they, they, they've only got two options, become Democrats or no longer be on TV and pushing this nonsense. Because, I mean, if you're looking for overrepresentation of a set of, of political beliefs, the people who claim to be so, so much the real Republicans during the Trump presidency who are on TV all the time. You had Nicole Wallace from the uh, Bush administration, Steve Schmidt. Uh, I mean, I, I can't even think of all the off the top of my head right now. But you know, all these former you know, so-called former Republicans who I mean, oh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Rick Wilson. These people were so GOP. So what happens now? I mean, I get the con can't continue, can it? No, it's like. There's always going to be an industry of, of um, former Republicans who just can't take it. This is not something new. It's gone back. You know, it was happening during the Bush years as well. People who just simply could not, you know, where has the Republican Party gone? It's terrible. Four years from now, people are going to be saying, you know, at least Trump did X and Y. You know, this is even worse. It's, it's always the way. Um, these guys were especially terrible because they didn't only attack Trump. And I'm fine with going after politicians. They, they, they mocked conservatives, they mocked conservative beliefs, and, but they do it under, under uh, the title of a former cons a Republican, you know, the real conservatives. And that's what just annoys me so much because it's no longer an ideological argument. It's just about personalities and these people are just on TV so that they can make uh, liberals feel good about themselves as they sort of demean conservatives. And it's, it's also the, 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 the problem with that is that you have networks that are putting these folks up for that very reason. They don't want to have real debates. They want to have, they, how many conservatives are really on CNN, let's say? I mean, I don't really watch it, but- Now, you know, no none, offense. but now the answer is none. It doesn't exist right, anymore, like, but go I ahead. I know that 
I, I don't want to insult, uh, you know, I know that we both know Essie Cup, right? I, I think we both worked with her at the same time. But she's, you know, she's out there ripping the Second Amendment, you know, uh, saying, you know, she's just basically just a liberal who still calls herself, I guess, a conservative. And that's just misleading. I, I just think we deserve or viewers deserve a better debate or maybe we don't deserve it. I don't know. But that, you know, it's still dishonest. I feel like there's no debate allowed at these places anymore. In fact, I think there are very few places in the media in general where there's any effort to allow a real airing of ideas. And I think it's because a lot of it is driven by audiences. I mean, I will say that uh, it's true. It's very true on the left. It's even a little bit true on the right. You know, that you'll have if there's an exchange of ideas that doesn't result in someone saying, you know, in someone effectively clearly trouncing and sort of belittling the other person, you have a lot of people who are just disinterested in that now. I mean, they, they don't even really want to hear the exchange. Not everybody, but that that's very common. And I think that's what the media ecosystems that exist right now have done. And it's a shame. And it's 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 much more pervasive on the left than it is on the right. But I do see it in both places. And and I feel like we understand the real crux of a lot of these arguments as as a, as the American people less than we otherwise would because everyone's just kind of protecting their brand now. No one, no one actually wants to get into it. I think that's right. And you see people threatening to cancel their New York Times headlines when, you know, someone writes, I'm sorry, their subscriptions when someone writes a headline they don't like or covers a story they don't like. Um, and obviously, you know, I get a lot of mail about, you know, National Review has this writer or that writer. Like, it's hard for people to understand that you can have more than one opinion. Or when people attack a publication, they say, you know, the National Review says this or the National Review says that when it's a columnist. It happened at The Federalist as well. You know, it's hard for people to understand that, that you're going to have a lot of different opinions and, and debate, which I think is healthy. Um, so, yeah, I think you're right. It's a lot of I just think a lot of audiences just no longer want to hear it anymore. And I hate to sound, and I, this will sound biased, but conservatives probably are that way because they're so sick of these big institutions being so biased that they don't want to, in their view, they're like, we don't need this debate here when we constantly hear it elsewhere. So I get that part of it, but it's just unhealthy. I agree. And I, I also think conservatives are so sick of the fake version of these debates that i mean it's 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 kind of like the west wing effect you know from the tv show by aaron stork in the west wing it's like oh like the democrats just have all these snappy comebacks and are just so wonderful and like good looking and smart and the republicans are always like i just i just love jesus and and i i i hate women and you know it's like that's that's what's what you get on the west wing as th those are all republicans right they're just they're a bunch of bible thumping anti-women kind of maybe racist and all the arguments kind of boil down to that you're like oh okay i i, I guess that's the way it really is Sometimes they see the light, right, and come over to the right side, and they, they see it the the right way. Yeah, and they, they have some really some really sort of saccharine violin music in the background as the conservative. You know, they play the clarinets in the background as the conservative goes, "Wow, you're right. I I never really thought of it that way." You know, they find their they find their heart and their humanity and vote with. Uh, it's a funny thing. It's just a little off topic because when people tell you to stop being partisan, they just mean stop being Republican. It's never you know the other way that they mean it. Um, you know, stop being a partisan and just embrace gun rights, you know, gun restrictions, or stop being a partisan and do this and that. Yeah. I mean, it's, again, it's, we, we, we hit this up quite often, but it's just, it's sort of an institutional problem now. And I'm not sure what can be done about it when, with these fake Republicans. Like, no, you know, I used to work with Tom Nichols, a fine guy, I guess, you know, and all that, but he's never really been a conservative. You know, there's no, what views of his are actually conservative? I don't know. And yet he's on there pretending to be this, uh, you know, erstwhile Republican who who has, you know, seen the light and is fighting against evil with it in his own party. But he's never been a conservative. So uh, it's just dishonest. Uh, we're speaking to David Harsani of National Review. And, and David, speaking of the lack of honesty in, in public conversations, I got to say this. So so Pete Buttigieg is now supposed to be the incoming Biden administration transportation secretary and and <laughs> some of the articles, some of the stuff on this have on have honestly been hilarious al already. Um, Pete, here's from NPR. Pete Buttigieg, president elect Biden's pick for transportation secretary, said, quote, he has a personal love of transportation, recounting train trips on Amtrak while in college and said he proposed to his new husband, Chasen, 
in an airport terminal. Oh, well, I'm not, I mean, this, this is a step away from, I'm not a doctor, but I stayed at a Marriott Express last night or whatever, a Holiday Inn Express, whatever it is. And like, this is, the media is actually doing this. Pete Buttigieg liked trains in college, so he should be the transportation secretary. It's amazing when you compare it to like what happened with Betsy DeVos or, you know, any, any, anyone actually in the Trump administration. Pete, Pete actually, uh, Mayor Pete, uh, it's like a thermonuclear cliche generator. You know, he says stuff like, and I'm making this up, but it's probably pretty close, you know, like uh, we don't build roads, the roads build us, you know, that kind of thing. And uh, he is perfect for, for the job where, where little is done and it doesn't really matter. So, I mean, I met Ray LaHood when he was Obama's uh, transport transportation secretary and he was one of the most ridiculous people i've ever met in person and i I wouldn't let him run anything either so i think this is a pretty good spot for pete yeah i i I guess you're going to see a lot more of this though and i remember when say what you will about his foreign policy in action but the ceo of exxon mobil which until recently was the largest and and you know wealthiest uh corporation in the world, I mean, the, the most valuable, I should say, corporation in the world. Rex Tillerson had that job. And when they were going to make him secretary of state, they acted like Trump had picked some uh, some like inebriated fool off the beach somewhere that he thought was funny to make. I mean, it's just there's no the, the, the media has so little in terms of standards and principles they apply now, you know, political journalism, if we want to be more specific about it, David, that you just feel like they they don't care anymore they don't know i mean how is this possible the double standards to be this blatant well and they well i don't know about that, that part but i do know that it's funny when you think about how they would talk about trump as this person who was completely unprepared for the job but yet obama who literally i cannot tell you what he did other than run for president essentially for about eight years before he became president i, I don't even know what he did before then i know he's a community organizer i don't even know what that means he never ran anything but he's treated as someone who is like incredibly um, proficient at everything and knowledgeable and, and ready to run a giant or biggest organization in the world, essentially, where where Donald Trump actually has ran pretty big businesses, et cetera. But so there's always going to be this double standard. Um, and P- Mayor Peach is part, part of it, even though it's and funny. I, I got to ask great. you, because I, I didn't get a chance to talk to you about this sooner. Um, but, uh, you know. Bet, I mean, not Betsy DeVos, uh, the wife of Jill Biden. Sorry, I was blanking on her name for a second. Jill Biden, where do you come down on the Dr. The Dr. Biden controversy? Well, I've noted on numerous occasions that the only people I call doctor are people who can prescribe me morphine and Dr. J. Those are the two. I, I've been persuaded to maybe do, I'm not Dr. Dr. J. I've been persuaded to maybe call Dr. Dre a doctor, but... Um, Kyle Smith, who writes at the National Review, wrote a scathing column and read her dissertation, which is just complete garbage. Um, I would say that I don't call people doctors who aren't medical doctors. I find it pretentious. I think it grates against the egalitarianism of American life for someone to demand that you call them by their credentials. And uh, I think it's kind of laughable considering what she's a doctor. And no offense to others who have... uh, been lucky enough to be able to go to school long enough to get that degree. David Harsani of National Review. Check out his latest at nationalreview.com. David, always a pleasure. Thank you. I've also had a personal love of transportation ever since childhood. More than once as a college student, I would convince a friend to travel nearly a thousand miles back to Indiana with me on Amtrak. Though I know that in this administration, I will at best aspire to be the second biggest uh, train enthusiast around. I spent a spring break in graduate school aboard a cargo ship studying there. Travel in my mind is synonymous with growth, with adventure, even love, so much so that I proposed to my husband Chaston in an airport terminal. What what does that have to do with being transportation secretary exactly? It doesn't, it doesn't matter. I mean, it matters, but the media is they're gonna, oh, it's amazing, it's great, you know, modern modern uh, modern romance in an air, airport uh, airport whatever lounge or wherever he proposed uh, proposed to his husband. 
You know, they're, they're, oh, they all love the story. They love the whole thing. It's going to be quite an amazing feat to watch the transformation of the national media from being viciously, psychotically opposed to the current administration to transforming and becoming uh, an administration pom-pom squad, right? They're going to love, the national media is going to love everything. They're going to, you know, two, four, six, eight, who do we appreciate? Biden! It's going to be, it's going to be tough to sit through. It's going to be tough to deal with, but that's what, the good news is you can come here, at least I'll tell you the truth about old man Joe. And what a joke, what a, an unbelievable farce this whole thing is. This guy is going to be president, but I guess the good news is that you too can be like a, a D minus student with, with rock bottom credentials in, in every aspect of your, of your formative years. Uh, and you too can be president of the United States. I don't know. You know, anyone, anyone can be president. All right. We get that from Joe Biden. Um, and, and the media is going to find ways to try to convince you that this is just great that it's fantastic. And uh, they're going to be straight up activists. They're going to be effectively, it, it will be as though they are receiving paychecks from the White House directly. Kaylee McEnany, the outgoing White House press secretary, knows this. Play nine. I asked reporter after reporter after reporter along the campaign trail, why aren't you covering this? I said, you have a laptop. You now have a first-hand witness in Tony Bobolinsky, literally the business partner of Hunter Biden, and you have a campaign in Joe Biden who will not deny the facts of this case. Remarkably, if they're not true, all Joe Biden has to do is come out and say, this is not true, this is false, this is defamatory, as President Trump did with Russiagate, which was a hoax. None of that, none of that happened. They did not deny it, and the press didn't cover it. It was the biggest act of journalistic malpractice in four years since the Russia hoax that they propelled in 2016. Journalism has to get to a higher standing place in this country. The American people deserve better. They don't to serve censorship and the reporters of today need to take a look in the mirror because they don't deserve to call themselves reporters at this point they are in fact activists sounds like something i'd say here on this show in fact i have said they're not they're not journalists they're activists i think about a million times and it's true but it's also not going to change doesn't mean we shouldn't point it out doesn't mean we shouldn't uh try to hold them to account but remember it's not viewed as a shortcoming among journalists to be an activist. You'll be promoted. You'll become more famous. You'll become richer. These are all good things for people, right? That's, that's the way they view it. So the incentives are all aligned for the continuation, the perpetuation of this insanity. Just understand that.